So good afternoon, one and all. I, Sunita Kotwal, Assistant Professor, Civil Engineering Department, welcome you all to the session three of day three of the sixth day online STTP. Our expert of this session is Mr. Anil Manochaji. He will talk on the topic water issues and options. We welcome you, sir, in this six day online STTP. So before the lecture starts. Let me introduce Mr. Manocha with you all. Mr. Anil, based in Singapore, is an experienced professional in water and waste management. He is executive director with Iron Exchange Asia Pacific Singapore. He has about 35 years of professional experience working in India, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, Middle East, Africa, and other parts of the world. He actively collaborates with stakeholders, technology partners, government, financial institutions in offering practical solutions for waste, conser uh, water conservation, water treatment, waste water treatment, and zero liquid discharge. Mr. Anil holds degree in mechanical engineering and is associated with various chambers like CII, Singapore, Water Association, India Business Forum, and Trade Organization. We welcome Mr. Anil Manocha to this six-day online STTP. Now I request Mr. Anil to please start with his expert lecture. Good afternoon, uh, uh, everybody, and uh, it's nice to be here uh, and make a presentation on the subject of water issues and options. Uh, I will be talking about uh, water related issues in a very practical approach. My presentation does not talk too much on technical things, but it talks more on practical approaches which we adopt. Uh, the way we have structured the presentation in this particular session, uh, I'll be talking about sharing the thoughts about water around us, its application, uh, the what various type of water sources, current and emerging. We'll be also talking about urban water management. Uh, we will address the issues on a practical approach we should take for solving the problems of suspended solids, bacteriological impurities, and dissolved impurities of water. We will also touch upon water solutions for homes, hotels, green buildings, district cooling centers, sewage treatment, recycle, community-based approach, uh, managing disasters. And uh, during our next two hours of water journey, we would like to see whether we have answered these questions uh, or not. Uh, I would appreciate if you could uh, put your questions on a chat box so that I will be able to see them and respond to them time to time. Uh, that will be the best approach to do. From my side also, I'll be taking a pause at certain intervals and I will uh, like to know and take your reactions. So please uh, let's see that we can make this session as lively and cooperative, uh, participatory better. Now, when we talk about water, uh, we all are aware that water is finite and this finite resources of water uh, is getting in demand and we need these resources for various activities. Various activities will be uh, industrialization, agriculture, population increase. And because of this, uh, we have seen that, you know, the, there's a stress on utilization of water resources. Now, when I look in context of India, India currently is a $1.7 trillion economy, which is likely to reach $5 trillion in the times to come. And when this economy grows from $1.7 to $5 trillion in a near future, uh, we will be facing a lot of changes at the operating place, we will see the issues of urban mitigation, 
currently india has a population close to 35% living in urban cities which will go to 55 a national average international average for urban population is close to two third so you will see a shift of people migrating from rural to urban for the basic purpose of expanding the economy we will also see a world's population growing from 6.5 billion current to 9 billion and when the population grows from 6.5 billion to 9 billion there will be a lot a lot of stress on agriculture and you will see a lot of water getting used for agriculture we will also see how we can create a balance now uh, since last two days uh, all of us must have analyzed and realized that about 97% of the water is sea water uh, 2% of water is logged in glaciers and what we see that uh, uh, this particular water is melting fast because of climate change and we are not able to capture this water for our needs and this water melts fast and it goes to the sea and this depletes us from the availability of fresh water also we have seen that less than 1% of the water available on the earth is fresh water now when we realize consider earth uh, uh, as a planet it has the total land mass area of earth it's a 680 miles of diameter if you look at the earth and more than 70% of the earth is covered with water and when 71% of the earth is covered with water which has only 1% of which is available as fresh water so we see that we create so much of stress on this fresh water and this fresh water is available to us is in the form of rivers lakes uh, underground sources and when we further dive deep into this utilization of fresh water we will see that more than 70% of this water is used in agriculture sector and balance 30% the figures could be 70 or 80 let's not talk about exact percentage but we try to sensitize ourselves that majority of this water which is 1% of the total water available on planet goes for agriculture purpose and less than uh, only 30% of 1% is available for our homes and industries and when you use only 30% of this water for homes and industries we create lot of stress <clears throat> now Uh, water utilization versus contribution to economy is a separate function which we will talk bit later now let's take a pause and think uh, though at homes and industries we use less than 25% of fresh water and out of this 25% uh, certain percentage goes to industry but when industry pollutes and discharges the untreated sewage and untreated effluent into the rivers or into the water bodies it spoils 100% of the water so uh, a question to be asked to ourselves is is it something right which we do or which we allow industries to do and we have a very live example in bias river something in 2018 where almost all the fishes and all the aquatic and marine life died because of industrial discharge and because of the insert discharge discharge which was highly contaminated with cod the oxygen level in the water in the river, surface water got reduced to zero and because of this dissolved oxygen getting zero all the fishes died so uh, please think that when we use 25% of water less than 25% water for our use are we morally right when we pollute 100% of the water and once we sensitize ourselves to this question we will again be compelled to take certain decisions which will allow the prevention of this water getting discharged into the open water bodies now this is a picture which talks about rivers uh, india is blessed to have uh, plenty of rivers available to us the rivers if you look at the river on the top which is brahmaputra river this river originates from tibetan plateau in china and it flows towards the various countries 
and it comes to India. Now, if you look at this map, somewhere here is China. Uh, here, if you go, we are talking about uh, Pakistan. Here you go, we are talking Bangladesh. And further down, we see Asian nation. So a, from the Tibetan plateau, we also have a river which is called Mekong. Mekong River Delta is a very fertile delta, delta which provides water to almost all the countries in the Asian region. And uh, we have also seen the similar problem what happened in Bias because of industrial discharge. Same problem we faced in a country like Vietnam when the industries in China discharged untreated effluent, that effluent went to Vietnam and it polluted the river and it killed almost all the aquatic and marine life. So by making this statement, what we can say, the water issue, if I do something wrong at my place, somebody else suffers. And then can we allow this to happen? We again have to think about it. So when you have, a dis when you have this type of issues where the effluent discharge or the bad quality discharge from one place disturbs the neighbor, whether it's neighbor is a country, neighbor is a state, or neighbor is my real neighbor besides living besides me. And if I do that, am I not putting myself to a possible war or conflict? Second river which we see is a Ganges River. Ganges River starts from Gangotri, if all of us must be knowing, it's it's a part of uh, it's a part of uh, uh, Himalayan glaciers and this river flows a distance of 2500 kilometers and ultimately it goes to Bangladesh. So this is one of the third largest river basin which we have and similarly we have certain rivers which comes to Punjab and which goes to Pakistan here and certain rivers within our India. So the network of river which is available to us is quite strong and with that network if you still have to face the problem of water shortage is something as a water treatment professionals we have to think are we doing justice to this natural resource now also at the same time india is so vast that we uh, face different type of rainfalls in in the minimum rainfall which we get is in in jaisalmer and some part of pakistan some part of punjab or bohar or that side where the rainfall is around 35 centimeter and also we get the maximum rainfall is Meghalaya, which is about 11 to 80 centimeter. Also the point to be noted is average rainfall in India is about 800 centimeters and this rainfall is not changed. Only what has changed is the pattern of rainfall and we are not able to capture the rain when it falls onto earth and the reason when you probe further it leads to a climate change. Uh, because of change in climate, the total water falls onto our land much faster and we are unable to capture. So if we adopt a proper technologies, if we adopt the proper systems, I think we can work towards addressing the issue of water conservation. Second source of water is the borewell water. And uh, probably in the previous lectures, you must have seen how the, the uh, strata of soil and how water extraction takes place. So from the earth's surface, we have gone so deep that we have hit the, hit the aquifers and we have started taking the water from aquifers and aquifers is the natural, I should say, protection for water, which we have started depleting. So we are probably taking all the water which is available in the mother nature's bank. And with this, we are talking about water shortage, water issues and all those things. So this is something which we talk about India. And after this, probably when we move forward, let us try to see and find answers what can be done. Let us be aware that whenever we have water issues, it is not a quick fix. And whenever we talk about water issues, we always talk about uh, water availability, water supply, and we always say there's a supply shortage. But when you will really go into detail, you will see the issue is not a water supply, water availability, the issue is of water management. 
and if we can manage the water properly i feel we can address lot of issues and it requires a long term commitment and integrated approach so whenever we are addressing the water issues let us not look water in isolation let us look water how it is connected to us in life we also need to understand what is the relation between water food and energy this is the lifeline we when we have to survive on this planet we need water we need food and we need energy and every places water plays a role now when we look at food and when we look at the current issues what we say in punjab we say that because of green revolution the water levels have gone down but then we have to answer question to ourselves am i using the water efficiently probably there are statistics available everywhere that the amount of water which i use to produce a crop is 40% more than the same production done in our neighboring countries the amount of crop which we produce per hectare is again 30 to 40% lower than what is produced in vietnam and uh, and uh, china also we consume three times more fertilizers than needed so as a result we are reducing the soil fertility and we are trying to supplement it with artificial uh, i should say fertilizers which is creating more problem on water and we are trying to create more issues for all of us and when we talk about energy again water is a source of energy it is a it is a media which gets from liquid it gets changed to steam and then steam produces the energy through a turbine and whether we have some efficient ways of producing energy or we have alternative ways of producing energy another point i would like to say here is that uh, uh, if i make a statement that india though is a water starved nation but we are exporting water we are ex exporting water in terms of crop which we export and the crop which we produce which is more than our requirement so every crop requires certain tonnage of water we have talked about rice we have talked about wheat and uh, we have also talked that india is blessed with a self sufficiency on food but the amount of crop the more, more crop we export indirectly we are exporting more water and there is a analysis that the amount of food exports out of india if it is prevented by either reducing the production or by changing the crop pattern we will save two times of water which is otherwise required for industries and for home use so as young engineers as a people like you who are getting into water business or who are already into water teaching please think about it whether uh, whether what we need to do we need to change or how do we need to change also we need to understand the linkage social linkage political linkage and economic linkage we have talked about uh, social linkage because if in case i produce uh, pollution i am going to end up into a fight uh, i talk about political linkage because uh, because of the pricing policy of water water is priced so cheap that we have lost or uh, are the importance or the water has lost the importance which otherwise it would have got and uh, economic linkage we have already spoken that uh, a complete economy is driven by water and we have seen in past when we read history we have talked about sindhu ghati sabhyata we have talked about mekong river delta the fertile deltas we have talked about sea routes so most of the economy is linked with water also please try to sensitize yourself on demand and supply gaps and importance of water management the moment we look into water management and water efficiency we will be able to overcome lot of issues related to water availability please also be aware that when where the society wherever you live wherever you belong to what are the pain points and it will be nice to put them on the chat box so that we can take up towards end of the session what can be done to address those issues uh, we also should be aware about what steps government is taking and what 
technological interventions are taking place. So when we talk about, when we relate efforts undertaken by government, let us talk about the Ministry of Jal Shakti in India, the efforts be taken for catch the rain, uh, the awareness programs for uh, agriculture and all those things. And also the technological providers, how they are bringing efficient technologies to conserve water. And I understand a lot of people in from Israel are working in Punjab to ensure that the agriculture productivity versus with respect to water uses is uh, increased. Uh, we also try to understand, are we, are we addressing the symptoms? Or are we addressing the core cause of the problem? So we sometimes we get you know attracted like you know if there's a water is contaminated with say arsenic or cadmium or nitrate, we look for the systems which are required to treat them. But uh, systems which are required, but we don't get into symptoms why this happened. So it is always better to think back what is the root cause of a problem and can I solve this problem by addressing the root cause. We also must understand that water is a global issue but the solution lies locally. There are so many examples in India. I think if you Google out, you will see something close to 100 water heroes who have transformed the lives of their people while doing water related activities in the area where they operate, where they work. So uh, you will always can learn from globe, from world, but the solution has to be local. And I am sure when you, as the session progresses for a few more days, uh, I believe one of the sessions you are having a local person talking about how he transformed the life in Rajasthan. Uh, also, please visualize the water technologies which are used in home. Uh, RO is very popular in Punjab, but is really RO a solution or it is a cause, is a problem causer. We also use a lot of bottled water and uh, we create plastic pollution. Do we have an option to plastic pollution? What type of water wastages we do? Can we use glass bottles, recyclable bottles? And can we avoid the single use of plastics in water sector or in our day-to-day -day lives? So if we try to sensitize ourselves, I feel we will make a positive contribution in the water journey, which we have started. Also look at efficient devices. At homes now, te technological advancements are taking place. There are a lot of taps which consumes less water and which helps to, to give you better uh, productivity. We have smart wash basins which can utilize the water and we have washing machines which are most efficient. We have detergents which consume less water and we have smart meters which, which talks to you when it comes to water uses. It relates your water users with your neighbor. It relates your water users with others and what is happening. So try to make a small beginning in understanding your home water consumption, home water tariff, compare comparison with neighbors. Uh, I am not sure whether uh, how many of us will be even knowing how much water we consume on a monthly basis and what type of price we pay to government for that water consumption. And the price which we pay, the bill we settle whether government can give you efficient water solution to meet out your 24 by seven water requirements. Also, because most of people participating in today's uh, uh, webinar are uh, professionals. So what sort of career opportunity exists in water sector? I, I would like to mention here that uh, even within India, uh, every year, there is something close to seven to 8,000 crores of rupees which are getting into water sector for improving the water connectivity, for improving the water quality, for improving the water innovations and all those things. So this opens a lot of opportunity in water sector. And uh, even if you are not from water industry and if you are from a say IT industry or if you are from a other industry, you can still contribute. Uh, we are talking about internet of things. We are talking about social aspects of water. We are talking about political aspects of water. So everybody who can relate himself with water can take part in this water journey. Start young. 
uh, I, we always say that we must try to provide water education at the schools and let us make our future generation water efficient uh, and let them perform better than all of us. Uh, we also should be aware about the United Nations sustainability goals. The United Nations had chalked out certain goals for till to be achieved till year 2030. I will not get into details, but I will leave it as an exercise to most of my uh, attendees here to understand what is UN sustainability goals and how the water plays an important role and what sort of in IoT interface takes place in water. So I am sure all of us know about water impurities, physical, chemical, biological, nowadays inorganic impurities, radioactive impurities and all those things. So we must relate that and we also must understand the technologies for safe water and be aware that proper managing the water, we can reduce gap between water supply and water demand. So please sensitize yourself that it is an issue of water management than the water availability. And uh, another very important point is please respect water and please relate it to your life. Please give the respect which water deserves because you will find if there is no water, there is no life. So please respect, start respecting and start relating it to your day-to-day -day activities. I'm sure you must be doing it, but it's my humble request to all of you again, please rethink over it. And then interact with subject experts, interact with local water heroes. India has over 100. Be aware of success stories, uh, local success stories, what we probably will hear about Rajasthan and international success stories like Cape Town, uh, South Africa, uh, Singapore, Israel, and examples within India. Now, in order to just to give you an idea, I can just share, talk about one minute on Cape Town because Cape Town was declared as a zero water uh, uh, city in South Africa. And what the government did was that government didn't hide any problems with the public. They started telling people every day on TVs, on news channels, that what is the water level in the dam and how much water they can expect to get and when they feel that they will not have water. And the country, the city, which was using something like 140 liters per person per day in the good times, the water brought was always brought down to zero and they started and the water available was even less than 20 liters. And by adopting a proper techno, proper methods of uh, communication, proper method of water conservation, proper method of engaging with the society, they were able to survive, survive in the crisis by consuming 50 liters water per person per day. Singapore is another example, a very successful example of water story. Most of you must be knowing that Singapore does not have its own water. There's no rivers in Singapore. And uh, the water which Singapore gets is imported from Malaysia. And if you look at the map of Singapore, it is surrounded by sea. So practically 100% of water in Singapore was imported when Singapore got independence from Malaysia about 50, 60 years ago. And then today, Singapore is able to produce 30% of water by recycling, capturing rainwater, using advanced technologies. And also they have a vision that in next 10 years, they will totally stop buying water from Malaysia. To, uh, that it's about 2060, they will stop buying water from Malaysia and they will be dependent on water conservation. They will be depending upon the technologies which can produce water at a low cost. And they will be also depending upon how to desalinate water, how to recycle the water. Israel is another example, which was, uh, which is like a desert country and this desert country, how they transform and how they have become the exporter of technologies to the world. And you will see a lot of Israeli scientists, a lot of Israeli companies are working within India to solve our problem. And we have many examples in India where by managing the natural water bodies, by managing the natural uh, ponds in the river, in the villages, by managing, conserving the rainwater by way of uh, tankas or by way of uh, natural uh, uh, methodologies, 
we have been able to provide water. It's important to note here that the city like Jaisalmer, which has got only 35 cm rainfall, is able to give water 24 by 7, drinking water to all the people. And the cities, there are part, some parts of states within India where the rainfall is more than 1100, we still face a water shortage. So it's again, so many examples like that. Now, let us talk about the water consumption. How much water we consume per day? The figures are roughly, average person takes about 120 liters per day. The figure could be anything between 110 to 160 liters per day. And when we compare this, there are various applications where the water is used, showers, toilets, leaks, other uh, places, cloth washer faucets. So important is not the use, important is that we consume something close to 120 or liters of water per day. And this use is not, is not uh, because of availability of water, is because we can afford. Uh, we, I will take the example of Middle East. If you look at Middle East, where there is no rivers, the complete water is desalinated water. And because these people can pay, they have a lot of oil money, the per capita consumption of water in Middle East is over 300. So when you say they consume more than 300 liters per person per day, and South Africa, Cape Town survived with 50 liters, so how much water we waste because we are wealthy? And again, example, I will say a country like Canada, which is very rich in water resources. They have such a efficient policies that the people have become so, I should say, responsible that their water consumption is less than 110 liters per person per day. So we thought I will share these examples of Middle East where there is no water, but they have money and they abuse water and country which has got a lot of water, they conserve water for their future generations. Now let us get into water applications and issues. When we look at water applications, we have various applications. I'll just quickly go through with household, drinking, cooking, gardening, commercial applications like hotels, restaurants, resorts, water for agriculture, we need for food, communities, hospitals, schools, anything which we think across us will need water. And whatever issues we face today is the water availability, how we'll get water to meet our needs so we always look for conventional sources of water. We have talked and alternative source of water, which we'll talk. How do we manage water? Extraction of water, storage, distribution, transmission, conservation. How do we manage water quality? How do we manage waste and reuse? How do we manage disasters? And how do we uh, uh, see how we can reduce the water uh, impurity by excess, avoiding the use of fertilizers? and what is the impact due to over extraction. So these are probably the issues which we face and these are applications. So issues and options, these are the, of my, uh, my talk is water issues and options. So I think we, I have defined the issues here and I will now dwell upon the options, applications all of us know. Now let us get back to, uh, let us get back to the water sources. If you look at the water sources present, we generally talk about water is available in lakes, glaciers, wells, bore wells, open wells, springs, etc. So these are the natural resources of water and these resources are becoming scarce day by day. We are always finding a shortage. And to supplement this, when we say 70% of the earth is covered with water and only 29% is the soil, we are seeing the alternative sources of water which is emerging like seawater, treated sewage and sludge, treated industrial effluent. Now, when we talk about seawater, we have a challenge of the cost of treatment, which the technology is are working to reduce the cost as much as possible. There are technologies where the sludge, sewage can be treated. And here it's important to know the example of uh, uh, UK, the Thames River in the United Kingdom, the water is recycled seven times before it is discharged. And this is becoming a very good source of supplementing the fresh water needs. And more and more people are working, including India, to conserve, treat this sewage to meet our water needs. 
and treated industrial effluents generally is used and recycled back in industry. So a combination of conventional resources and emerging resources will help us to address the water issues. Now, this particular slide talks about the water contamination in a very brief. We have seen a physical contamination in water. We have seen a chemical contamination in water. And in chemical contamination in water, we have uh, also talked about man-made contamination because of industrial pollution discharge, excess use of fertilizers. And there are natural contamination because of the earth strata, because of the way water flows, rocks, and all those things. And we also have talked about the bacteriological contaminations in water. And uh, all of us know about what is potable water, what is safe water. So let me skip this slide. And uh, also we'll see how the drinking water becomes unsafe. See, when we have a safe, when we get the water from say a river or when we get the water from some municipality or anywhere, the water is considered to be safe or potable. And we use some sort of inorganic, chemicals uh, which pollutes the water uh, and this water this uh, comes from industrial processes as well as plumbing systems so when the water flows through the plumbing lines it goes to the industry we contaminate water with mineral, uh, metals like fluoride arsenic lead copper chromium mercury antimony cyanide then we have organic contamination organic contamination is because of uh, uh, domestic and industrial effluent, pesticides, then biological contamination and radiological contamination, like you know, uh, radioactive elements. So these all are the typical contamination which comes with the water. And uh, uh, with this, I would like to take a small pause and say that a problem to ponder is water problem, wicked problem, agree or disagree. And uh, do we have a right solution or instant solution to water? Probably the answer is no, because we do not know how do we analyze the real problem. We always talk the water problem and relate it with urban consumption, we relate it with waste, we relate it with climate change. But if we have to work in finding a right solution, we have to look at the various perspectives, how the problem and what be the appreciated response, how to address these problems. Uh, my next topic of today's discussion now with this, let us now move to urban water management. I'll be talking about urban water management. I'll be also talking about community water management. I think somebody has to mute his mic as a disturbance at my end is taking care of my, thank you. So, so we are talking about urban water management. When we look at urban applications, uh, we have talked that the country, I, I'll talk in terms of India. India is going to grow from $1.7 trillion to $5 trillion economy. And we are expecting another 20% of India's population will move to urban cities. So when the current 35% of Indian population becomes 55% of Indian population, there is going to be a lot of stress on water. In urban cities, generally we use about 120 liters per person per day, where in villages, the water consumption per person is not that high. So it's roughly around 50 liters per person per day. So we, this 20% people moving from village to urban, will put additional stress on fresh water resource. So uh, we have to address the issue. How do we mitigate this additional requirement of water which will fall on urban? We have talked that economy cannot grow if there is no water and India is bound to grow to 7 trillion, three times of the current requirement, how we are going to overcome that. And when we go and travel in an urban city, we face all sort of problems. We face air pollution, we face water pollution, we face transportation. So how we can work towards solving this problem. And we have already stated in my previous presentation that water alone, you cannot address, you have to address the nexus of water, food, energy, and whatever we do in our day-to-day -day life. So when we say that these buildings 
are there so how can i make them water neutral or how can i make them energy neutral how can i see that these buildings i can still use but then they do not consume energy and they can become energy neutral how i can recycle the water how can i manage the uh, recirculation how how many times i can reuse the water how can i address the floods which comes into the city and how can i conserve the rain water how can i make this city a carbon neutral how can i bring the concept of urban farming what can happen if i am able to conserve the rain water and when i want to talk about rain water conservation i talk about the concept of sponge cities you know i talk about the concept of building marinas across the periphery of country i uh, city i talk about uh, concept of green cities i talk about context, concept of green fuels and i talk about the concept of non revenue water so these are the concepts when we talk about urban water management comes into play and we'll try to get enlightened on these concepts in the next slides now when you have a urban needs and when you are a citizen living in urban we need water for domestic use we need what we, uh, and this domestic use or potable need so we need a water supply management that's one key component of urban city planning we need a waste management uh, in place we need liquid and solid waste management techniques we need to address the issues of storm water we need to address the issues of energy by adopting non conventional resources and we need to bring the concepts of green energy so when you talk about urban needs we bring these components and these components get addressed by the uses and by the technologies and so there are various adoptions there are various purposes so how do we handle the potable water what how do we handle the uh, district cooling systems how do we address the issues of energy efficient devices how do i uh, generate Uh, power from sewage how do we generate power from sludge how do i uh, save water from storm water how do i save water from rain how do i link the rivers the lakes within my city so that i don't waste water and by linking these lakes and cities i can make them more more beautiful how can i use take advantage of uh, solar power how can I take advantage of uh, uh, energy from waste that is sludge and how can i do that so all these concepts gets integrated when we try to solve and address the urban needs of citizens so uh, indirectly what we are saying that when we are addressing the urban cities problem we are bringing the concept of sustainability we can sum up with a single statement can we make our urban life sustainable now when we say can we make our life sustainable what does sustainability means so sustainability means that our present requirement the present generation requirements are met without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs means i must use water i must use food but i must be in a position to leave the same water and same food for our grandchildren and great grandchildren so i should not become a deterrent to their requirement which will come in the future to come so the moment we look at sustainable solutions we will realize and we will become more realistic in consuming water or any resources natural resources and the moment we relate this with our future generations i think lot of responsibility will come in addressing the needs this is a typical uh, layout of a city uh, water management uh, you can say that the water is extracted from a ground resource it is passed through a water treatment plant after treating the water through the plant it is taken to a storage tank that overhead tanks which we normally see in cities it goes to the houses or industries and then it is used by us it gets converted into waste and when it into waste it's get it's passed on to the waste treatment system like whether it's a sewage treatment system or industrial treatment system and then this water is either thrown back into the river 
or it is recycled. So uh, these are the typical real pictures. Any typical lake in our uh, urban city will have an intake system. This intake system uh, will bring the water, pump the water from here uh, to this water treatment plant. And in this plant, through these pipes, water reaches these storage tanks and then from there it reaches home. So what important, I use the word NRW, non-revenue water. The water, when it leaves the water treatment facility and reaches our home, we lose something close to 35% of water by way of leaks, by way of any uh, revenue loss, by way of theft. And this 35% of water, which is brings no revenue to the municipality and which brings stress to all of us at the homes because if this we get 100 liters of water from the plant at home i only get 65 liters so and this infrastructure it if it is not upgraded we will try and say we'll try and having the same problem of uh, transmission losses here it is important to note that this transmission losses is, are called non revenue water and uh, we should be uh, it's important for me to mention here that our neighboring countries are working towards reducing this non-revenue water. And today, if you Google the uh, Dhaka water supply in Bangladesh, the non-revenue water is less than 7%. So they have worked in last 50 years to reduce this water from 55% to 7%. And that municipality has become cash positive. And most of the people who wants to give money for them to expand and do water supply uh, network expansion. So there's another example of a poorest country called Cambodia. Cambodia, the capital of Cambodia is Nom Phen, and Nom Phen, the water losses are less than 5%. So these are the examples available within Asia that people and municipalities are working towards reducing non-revenue water. Now, when I compare there are certain countries where the non-revenue water is very high. And let us not be shy to mention that if you go to a developed countries like Europe, uh, there's a country like uh, where the non-revenue water is over 35%. India average is close to 36%. And the moment we conserve this water and we bring it down to say 5% or 7%, which is possible with the technological interface, I think you will get additional 25% water to be used by industry, to be used by domestic, to be used by agriculture, and it will reduce the demand uh, on the stressed water resource. So when we talk about <coughs> potable water, we have talked about intake water system storage, and whatever comes to your mind, you can keep on putting in a chat box and we'll try to answer those questions at the end of the day. And when we treat this, I've shown you a plant. So this is typically the type of plants which are used for treating the water. This plant, uh, this particular plant receives the river water, which is a coffee color, and it converts that water into a clean uh, water, which is as clear as mineral water and makes the water suitable for a population of 2 million people, 2 million people, over 20 lakhs people. And the technologies have advanced so much that this can be compacted. The technologies are so have come so fast and so efficient that you can achieve the similar type of output in a lower footprint and a lower space. And any municipalities, any locations where there is a stress of uh, current facilities being overutilized, you can do some sort of modification by using this lamina plates so that this capacity output throughput can be increased by another 40 to 50%. So technologies have come where you can expand the capacity of existing water treatment systems. When we look at, when I talked about the clarifier technology, I talked about the source of water is uh, uh, coffee color. This is the type of clarifier which works and this is the water you get. If you see this water, you can see the reflection of a cloud. So water becomes so clean and all the dirt is collected in the center. Is what you see at the yellow color is the is the dirt which is removed from the water, and this again is not wasted. This again is taken through a system where you can 
dispose it off as a compact mass or you can use it for construction industry. This is another example of a new technology is where you can expand the capacities by putting these plates. What you see in the blue is our plates, which are inserted, inserted in the clarifier to expand the capacity. So after, after clarification, the water passes through filter. There are various type of filters. Normally in filter, we use gravel and sand, and these filters are, uh, are very efficient in terms of performance. And most of the wastewater of filters is recovered and recycled back. So uh, practically from clarifier to filter, there's no water loss except the except the system losses of hardly less than 1% or so. And these are all pressure filters when you have to send the water through overhead tanks and capacities, we install a chain of filters to handle the water. And these are a continuous filters where sometimes, you know, you are in a remote area and the turbidity of the lake or a river is not very high you cannot use those clarifiers because those clarifiers are big and they are taking a lot of space and money. You can use the system, uh, this uh, gravity filters, which work 24 by seven without stoppage. And one stream gives you good water and there's an automatic system that it keeps on backwashing simultaneously. So we have a system where the, the, the continuous sand filters are operated. And if you see in this system, there is no wall so you do not need the intervention of people to manage the system. It's like a donkey, it will keep on taking the water, giving you good water. So these type of technologies are available nowadays to address this. And the latest technology which people talk about is a membrane technology for water filtration. And it reduces, it compacts the size of a water treatment system and it gives you a very good quality of water. So these are all uh, vertical membranes. If you, when, when you will get more into membrane and you will like to uh, see the desalination membranes, you just watch here. These are all vertical membranes. Generally, we differentiate vertical membranes as ultra filtration or micro filtration membranes. And sometimes the membranes are installed horizontally. They are used for the uh, seawater applications or brackish water applications for removal of salinity. Here, we generally remove the bacteriological impurities and suspended impurities in the in the pretreatment section through UF and MF technology. Now let's again take a small pause and let us try to revisit what we have spoken so far. So we talked about non-revenue water and the non-revenue water, hopefully you will all remember that the water which is lost in the pipelines uh, when it leaves our plant and reaches our home and we talked about India average is about 36% and the and uh, there are countries who have worked on this and increased resources. We have also uh, like you to think how much percentage of water is wasted in a home RO plant. I have not answered this question now, but I will answer it a bit later when I'm talking about home water systems. But just realize that when you get in the home is 65% of the water which left the plant and when you put the 65% of water in the home RO, how much water really you use for your applications. And uh, uh, also we talked, will you agree that we are doing virtual export of water? And I would like you to relate it with uh, some example I gave in my talk before, how we are really virtually exporting water when we do some export of India. And we also talked about though at domestic and industry, we use less than 25% of fresh water, but we can con we have a capacity to contaminate 100% of our river water and all. And we talked about certain examples. So if we relate to whatever I have spoken, we have tried to find answer to these few questions, which is not definitely not the all, but I thought let us take a pause and refresh ourselves what we've learned so far. Now let's go to next. So after covering the water side for the urban city, where we have talked that for urban city, we need water for drinking, potable factories, industries. And now we convert this water into sewage. And when you convert the water into sewage, so we need a sewage treatment systems. Now, why these sewage treatment systems are needed? Because if we discharge the untreated sewage to the rivers, we will be killing the aquatic and marine life. So even 
to preserve our rivers to preserve our natural resources we have to see that the sewage is properly treated and disposed uh, we will talk about treatment first and we will talk about recycling with later so we have a sewage collection systems and pumping systems you every home everywhere you would have seen that then we have sewage treatment plants and then we have treated sewage it is recycled back to industry or somewhere or it is thrown into the river back is a different aspect when we handle the sewage we had the conventional systems if you look at it if you remember having visited a sewage treatment plant you always have to put a hanky or handkerchief on your nose because the plant will be very smelly you will see that you know the the uh, the sludge has no free oxygen and then it smells it stinks so the typical conventional old sewage treatment plants were like you know we had a clarifier activated sludge process secondary clarifier sand filters and sludge digestion so this typical old generation sewage treatment plants are available everywhere and wherever these plants are there whenever you drive or pass you always have to put a handkerchief on your nose that this smells and there is a reason for that and if you could put a reason in the chat box i'll be very happy when i read that at at the end of my seminar so against the conventional process now we talked about new generation process is membrane bioreactors membrane bioreactors a technology to convert sewage into good water and this membrane bioreactors are you know the membranes are a very thin small hair like structure if you look at imagine the hair which we have so these uh, membranes are even 1000 uh, times smaller in diameter as a man's hair and this pore size helps all impurities to get attached to the membranes and then clean water comes out of the membrane particles so this is a elect microscopic view of a membrane and this i have already told each membrane is 1 upon 1000 times in diameter as of our hair so just imagine how small it will be and what it does to clean the system and here it is important to to use the concept of molecular weight cutoff because all of you are engineers scientists and all so the all these membrane systems are designed based on molecular weight cutoff and all the impurities we have have certain molecular weight so the concept of physical separation based on molecular weight cutoff and this molecular weight cutoff determines the diameter of membranes and these once we design the diameter of membranes based upon the impurity level you know which type of membrane to be used for physical separation of water or sewage so we move forward the plants i showed you one big plant of sewage before and the plants have become so compact nowadays that you can even bury under the ground and people will not know that there is a sewage treatment plant so this is practically a small sewage treatment plant for a resort or a hotel which picks up all the water from dirty water sewage water from the resort or a hotel uh, recycles it back to the hotel for purposes so it requires if you see the advantages very compact in design minimum land uses minimum power and high quality of effluent and the operating costs are much lower these are again few installations which are installed these are the type of rotating drum skimmers which are used for treating the sewage and these are all the sewage treatment plants which are installed in a places you can install it in your housing societies you can install in your residences wherever you feel and the it combines the technology of activated sludge with rotating bioreactor and lamina clarifier again this is another example of a sewage treatment plant packaged sewage treatment plant which can be used so uh, what is important here why i am showing these pictures is to appreciate that the technologies have improved so much that even the sewage treatment plant when you pass you will not have to put handkerchief on your mouth and it will not look bad it will look elegant you know so So, so these are the few pictures of the plants which are normally used normally supplied to various factories to various industries to various hotels and the technology is again membrane bioreactor uh, we can get into this much later if whoever is interested can uh, put his email id i'll send you the catalogs and brochures about this 
And this is a typical sewage treatment plant which can be installed uh, in any place. It is like, you know, technologies like plug and play. So just in, connect the pipe, inlet pipe and outlet pipe, and the system starts working. So, so, so many, so many uh, sewage treatment plants nowadays are you are employed based upon this technology. And uh, you could see many examples. Uh, I'm sure that uh, places where you are, you must have seen these examples in your neighborhood also. And the water from sewage treatment plant can be as clean as the uh, raw water. I can say that, you know. Uh, after sewage treatment plant, we come into, uh, we have talked about uh, uh, filtration. We have talked about sewage. Now, when we are in an urban city, we need a lot of water. We need air conditioning. We need uh, heat transfer media. So a lot of water is used in providing in gas district centers for heating and cooling. So heating and cooling is another very critical application where a substantial amount of water is used. And again, you need a holistic approach. How do we manage the, the energy cost when you try to heat or cool the city or the apartment or the house based upon the need of that time. So again, these plants are again fully automated. They can be controlled through PLC. They can be controlled on your mobile phone. The technologies have become so advanced that you can run all these plants on your uh, mobile phones. Then we talk about decentralized uh, treatment plants. You can collect the uh, waste from your kitchens, laundries, uh, silage treatment, and you can use these type of systems to for solid waste treatment and disposal. These are slightly bigger plants for solid waste treatment and disposal. But again, we can use this waste for generating power because most of the silage which we get from our kitchens or food waste or whatever has a lot of uh, calorific value and a lot of methane. So we convert this and use this methane for burning. Uh, so now when we look at the city goals, uh, uh, we, we see that you know every city need to work on a clean, safe environment. We need to have a requirement for fresh water. We need to have a requirement of wastewater disposal systems, sewage treatment plants, solid waste handling. So practically, we talk about achieving the goals by various technologies, by various networks, which we have talked so far. And then this smart city goals, when we talk that when we are designing a smart city, we don't want flooding. We don't want, we want stormwater collection system to be very proper and we should be able to link the rivers. We should be uh, you know, working on various other aspects. Uh, another aspect which we fa face in cities, now I will talk about the floods. We have spoken about fresh water. We have talked about sewage water. We have talked about silage. We have talked about water application for heating, cooling, and other application within urban city. Now we also face a problem of drainage. See, we have seen that you know during the flooding, uh, you get a lot of water on the streets, which is very difficult to pass, and then it creates a problem of flooding. And uh, uh, we talk about the concepts of rainwater harvesting, stormwater management, managing disasters. So this is another aspect of water treatment in cities, and these are very common pictures we face. So the way we develop new and new cities, we concretize the space. By concreting the cities, we are not able to allow the water to percolate down the soil and it creates a water flooding problem. Uh, this is another example where how the city planning is done, that wherever you got car parks, there's always uh, gaps so that when it rains, the water goes down the earth. And you could see a small greenery. These are all the plants which take water and grows. Uh, small plants like grasses and all those things. So it is not always right to do concrete application when we design a urban city. It's always good to have a balance of white and green, concrete and greenery. And if we think about this design, the water percolates down the earth, it increases the level of tube well waters and the underground waters, and it gives you a sustainable solution. So 
we have the concept of green cities when we look at green cities we every city would like to have 80% of building should be efficient and green we want that uh, 15% of the housing should be in affordable capacity and we should achieve 20% reduction in energy and water so if we achieve these three goals then we help in saving the costs and we help in saving the life of people help in efficient use of natural resources and we can ensure that the water efficiency and waste water management techniques are used the industry contribution like i am from a industry i am from a water industry uh, i i uh, people like me they provide technical solutions so industry interface could be providing energy efficient technologies providing uh, solar power technologies providing power generation on sewage treatment and reducing the water requirement through sewage recycle so the industry can contribute in achieving the city goals and providing benefit to city of course when industry will come much after once we have policy have been made the people have decided to make the city green uh, we have talked about the green building concept and uh, this particular building you see a lot of greenery uh, why i relate this picture because this uh, greenery is rising up so this is bringing an another concept of vertical farming the farming so far has been horizontal now the concept of vertical farming has come up and uh, people are taking advantage of the technologies to see that certain percentage of food is given by the urban side of the country so when we talk about green building concepts we talk about energy efficiency we talk about renewable efficiency we talk about water efficiency we also talk about the using the building material which are environmental friendly in terms of specifications Our objective of green building is to ensure that there is waste reduction there is toxic reduction the indoor air quality is good and we achieve a smart growth and sustainable development i am mark this sustainable development i once again in red because we talked about sustainable development previously and uh, i will just i will just take an example here of singapore now singapore is a country which doesn't have water even the water is imported and singapore does not have agriculture all 100% agriculture is food comes from outside from various countries uh, the there is a objective of the government that they will produce 30% of their food requirement through vertical farming so a lot of initiatives are done to ensure that 30% of the food requirement of the small country of uh, 60 lakhs people is met by internally choosing the te uh, techniques of vertical farming so uh again these are the these are the concepts of recycling we can use lot of technologies for recycling I, let me not get into more details and uh, work on this but these are all the technologies which can be used for recycling the water and uh, uh while i move forward i will say the sewage we treat can be used the water from sewage can be used can be reused we can generate uh, uh sand and grit from the waste we can clean the recyclables the organic solid waste from homes can be used for generating power so this is a integrated approach where nothing is wasted and when we talk about a no waste solution we bring the concept of circular economy and sustainability and green economy so it will be good for all of us to know and differentiate on circular economy green economy sustainability by using technological interface by changing the way we use the natural resource technological contribution towards recycling is a technological uh, technology which are available this is a fluidized media reactor or mixed uh, membrane bio reactor ultra filtration technology we have talked i was talking about vertical as ultra filtration or physical impurities and horizontal for reverse osmosis 
रिवर्स ऑस्मोसिस प्लांट्स आर जनरली यूज्ड फॉर रिड्यूसिंग द सैलिनिटी ऑफ वाटर एंड द अल्ट्रा वायलेट फॉर डिसइंफेक्शन सो इन ऑर्डर टू टेक इट फॉरवर्ड एंड रीएम्फसाइज द नीड ऑफ रीसाइक्लिंग वी हैव अ डोमेस्टिक नीड ऑफ वाटर वाटर कम्स टू डोमेस्टिक नीड्स इट गेट्स डर्टी इट इज ट्रीटेड थ्रू अ ट्रीटमेंट प्लांट and it is disposed of to river that was a conventional way but instead of doing this if we recycle it by putting another plant and reuse it so we are talking the concept of total water recycling so what this recycled water where it can be used we can use this recycled water for toilet flushing gardening floor washing boiler feed cooling water makeup and process water so Uh, we have talked about sludge recycle where the waste from kitchens and bathrooms is recycled back for treatment and it is ideal for residential complexes hotel and institutions so uh, we talked about renewable courses we talked about different technologies and uh, let us spend some time on rainwater harvesting what we talk about rainwater water harvesting is that we should control we should allow the rain to get captured where it falls even today when you talk about the uh, mission jal jeev ministry of jal jeevan it talks about it they also talk about catch the rain where it falls where it drops so the moment we can do this water stopping or rain water stopping at our places we will be able to solve we will be able to conserve the water so there are again certain systems how the rain falls how it is captured and how it can be recharged i i am just leave a thought here that there are technologies available to conserve this rain water and make it fit for any application which you feel is required for rain water harvesting this rain water harvesting can be used at individual bungalows or it can be used for residential complexes or commercial complexes so anywhere you feel it can be incorporated in when it looks at the costing the payback period for rain water harvesting technologies is less than a year you are able to recover back your investment and rain water brings a very good source for meeting your requirement of water when uh, you feel that how the you know the people in jaisalmer in rajasthan are able to capture their drinking water needs uh, capture rain water to meet their drinking water needs through the similar technology so there is a similar uh, technology works in villages and areas Uh, where the water is con uh, in scarce, that people are able to conserve and reuse it and recycle it back for their applications. Another emerging water resource is sea water. The sea water, uh, as we know, that ninety-seven uh, percent of water available on the Mother Earth is sea water, and seventy-one percent of Earth for Earth is having sea water. So, sea water technologies are. getting lot of innovative attention the challenge here is to bring down the cost of treatment uh, the cost of treatment of sea water is coming down drastically even today the te with technological intervention the cost of treating sea water has come down to less than 5 paisa per liter and the aim there is a possibility that this cost can be further brought down another 40% in the times to come so sea water will become a very viable source to supplement the scarcity of fresh water from lakes and rivers and if we just imagine and just imagine the map of india uh, there sea all across the boundaries east to west when you see the map of india the boundaries are sea water so uh, as a country which is having so much of rivers so much of water do we still feel that we will have a water shortage in the times to come a question again for you to think so let us recap we talked about the emerging sources of water we talked about rain water sewage treatment water uh, sea water sludge water industrial waste water for internal use so these are the new sources of water which can be reused it will be nice to have your comments on the chat box to say yes or no to a question whether can we solve the water scarcity by effective water management let's see what happens later on now this is a model which probably uh, can work in solving the urban problems 
see in urban cities we always have the issue of cost so we talk about the concept of public private participation so if we work with the governments we work with industrial players we work public we can devise systems and technologies to improve the efficiency in giving the right technology at the right cost to the people so that they can live a better life now this particular thing i just thought i'll just take a minute and tell you how do i select a home water purifier see most of us people we see lot of advertisements in the market and we always are confused whether what type of clarifier i should use and invariably the decision goes in favor of ro uh, why ro because uh, because of the probably the marketing or advertisement on the way you know the the technology is brought to us through media that we feel that if i have to solve a water problem i should go for a ro and in ro plant if you would have noticed that 70% of the water goes to waste if you feed 1 liter of water or 100 liters of water to ro plant what you get is a good what is only 30 liters and 70 liters of water goes waste imagine uh you are losing 35% of water as nrw and out of that 65% of water 70% of 65% of water is used as waste in ro plant so a question again to us are we doing right that without thinking i install a ro plant at home probably answer is yes or no uh, ro plant may be needed for certain applications but for for most of the applications you can manage with other membrane based solutions a ro can only be should be used of a when the water is having certain total dissolved solid contents which cannot be removed by other technology and as a water industry as a water people we always tell government to come with a regulation that ro should be banned if the water tds is less than is more than uh, less than certain ppm so uh, for us as a consumer i always relate you know the water like a antibiotic when i go to a doctor for a headache or when i go to a doctor for a fever instead of giving me a panadol or instead of giving me a uh, ceridon he gives me antibiotic some mycin and all because that he is sure that you will take care of all your problems but if i can work with a crocin why i need a antibiotic so please relate ro like antibiotic it is not needed for all the illnesses so we do not need ro for all the problems and there are so many solutions you can go for a micron filtration solution you can go for a disinfection solution and think before you buy and invest in ro i talked about plastic bottles uh, can we avoid plastic bottles now there are people who are able to give you a glass bottles you know so if i take glass bottles i will be reducing the plastic pollution and i will be able to recycle this water and these type of systems can be this type of technologies can be like atm technologies where you can bring your bottle or you can use this water and take this water out and it gives you cost advantage and gives so many other advantages now these are the type of technologies which are used for natural disasters so we do always face a disasters floods we do flash flash floods we do floods and water becomes stress water contamination uh, issues rises so we can use some sort of mobile water treatment systems for giving supply of water and in this mobile water systems also we have hot hot and cold dispensers so that people at least can get maggi or something for food because they will not have access to the food to cook so we have hot and cold water dispensation options and this plant can be mounted on a truck or a trolley and go from place to place so this is a response towards managing disasters so let's take a small pay, uh, pause here and uh, let us see as a individual what choices i can make to conserve the natural resources the choices could be the food we eat uh, we i am sure that all of us must be knowing that uh, how much kg of water is used to produce 1 kg of chicken or 1 kg of beef or 1 kg of vegetables 
and if i can get similar type of minerals with a type of food do i need to have b type of food the way we travel do i need to take my car all the time can i not travel by cycle or can i not use the public transportation can i do something to that energy we consume so there are small so many smart systems smart technologies can i use that and finally i will say as a individual first let us respect relate water with each of us and the moment we do it we can definitely work towards solving the water challenges now a small recap before we move to community based solutions uh, so far in my presentation uh, we have talked about applications of water sources of water urban water management we have addressed the various issues of impurities suspended impurities bacteriological impurities homes hotels green buildings district cooling sewage treatment recycling please put any questions you have if i have time permits we can take it there now from urban now let us get into a community based solution in communities you know you always get contamination in groundwater I, i'll focus this presentation towards groundwater contamination and less of surface water because we have almost covered all the surface water related issues so this next few slides are focused towards how do we address the groundwater dissolved contamination which we face and uh, we always know how our communities lives and they need a protection towards safe drinking water and what can be done to them when we talk about groundwater contamination and when we talk about the problems around us we have talked about for we see the fluoride problem heavy metal nitrate iron manganese arsenic organic chlorination disinfection so these are typical problems we faced in community uh, in various countries and i i would like you to relate it with punjab because punjab also have similar type of problems and we go towards finding a solution to these problems so we have a problem understood but what is the solution so one solution people will say that uh, don't use fertilizers don't use this we'll have all don'ts so that you know we uh, don't contaminate so that's the best thing we can do but if by virtue of any economic considerations by virtue of any reasons we end up in polluting the water then we cannot we cannot just uh, uh, close our eyes and sit with it we have to address the symptom we have to address the uh, symptom and give you a solution at the point of use so there are various concepts and uh, uh, i have just mentioned certain you know the parameters uh, of dissolved impurities arsenic cadmium mercury nickel so these are certain impurities by the who and us environmental protection agency standards so uh, i am sure all of you must be aware i will not get into details but yes the moment the water crosses these parameters it is considered as contaminated and not fit for drinking and how do we do that sometimes you know there is a gap between analysis and actual application so there are certain type of field kits which are available which can be used for analyzing these parameters uh, let's talk about fluoride removal systems so there are simple technologies for removing fluoride and all of us know that fluoride affects the bone the problems with fluoride is it cause the gastrointestinal problems allergies anemia and urinary tract problems these are typical causes of excessive fluoride in a problem and the problem starts with our dental uh, the first of all our teeth becomes like this if there is excess fluoride which is beyond the who permissible limits and ultimately it affects our skeleton it affects our uh, body and we end up in having this type of disease so uh, you can just imagine from starting from teeth and, and ending up to this because of excess fluorides uh, uh, and and this type of gastric intestine issues so if there is a fluoride what can be done there are various technologies for fluoride removal you can go by precipitation technology you can go by reverse osmosis or you can go by adsorption principles now whenever we select a technology it is always better that use a technology which can be easily used by communities you cannot bring a very sophisticated technologies like ro or addition of chemicals which 
you will find it difficult for communities to to uh, handle and when we say communities i will always say that communities are generally driven by women and in communities if i can give a system which can be easily operated and if i can get it operated by a small child or a woman which is so simple it is much better so we use some sort of uh, medias uh, these are absorption media where which helps to absorb the fluoride on the surface and uh, these medias are charged in a vessel in a systems like this this is a fluoride removal system which is so simple to make that the media is charged here and uh, uh, you can get a fluoride free water at the outlet so one can design a system which is suitable for 150 200 people gives them a protection against fluoride contamination and the what is required here is to recharge this media with a pac polyimmune chloride once in 3 days once in 4 days or once in a week depending upon the depending upon the contamination and the resins which are used for removing fluorides they last easily for 2 to 3 years so you can get a very simple solution uh, of a small size like this tank size like this which gives you protection against fluoride and it protects you against fluoride probably the disease like this can be totally eliminated so uh, and when you this is a plant for about 150 people and you can get a bigger plants you can slightly go for a thousand people and even you can go for some plants which you can maybe for a community or for a village which can be installed and even you can do a solar panel interface so that you can create a stand alone uh, fluoride removal systems now while i take example of uh, solar panels i take example of these tanks i am telling you because uh, this similar type of concept can be used for other contamination like nitrates and other things uh, this also is another way you can go for a slightly bigger plants which can solve the problem of 2000 people and when you see 2000 people you can solve the problem and probably you can disperse the water through vending machines people can come and collect the water and go while we do that while we encourage that people should do this because you should be able to recover the cost of operation and if somebody has to pay a small money say 10 paisa 20 paisa 1 rupee for getting the fluoride free water i think that will be a, a model which will be sustainable to be operated by communities so this model can be easily used for any contamination which can be which comes and with the technology of digital uh, and iot this can be again signals can be sent through Uh, through uh, internet through uh, through uh, satellite uh, to the mobile phone of a operator or to the central control room and corrective actions can be taken so that it is not necessary that all the technical people are required at site so we can control it to remotely from any place in the world so there are various systems which can work from 150 people to 12000 people and can give you protection against fluoride we have talked about technological interface we can do this similar type of concept can be used for heavy metal recovery if you see heavy metal we have got heavy metals like chromium arsenic cadmium lead mercury and these metals are considered to be toxic in nature and uh, they causes lot of problems like kidney liver failure skin bones teeth and again uh, each contamination have their own uh, problems lung cancers kidney failures and again we can use a similar type of a uh, resin which is selective to a heavy metal and this again in this tank instead of having fluoride resin we can have a heavy metal removal resin and similar concepts can be used for heavy metal recovery so these are typical schemes uh, similar is for nitrate nitrate is a chemical impurity in the water which does not smell which has got no taste and you cannot see so if the nitrate contamination is present in water you will not be able to understand unless you analyze so uh, and nitrate brings this blue baby syndrome because nitrate takes the oxygen from the hemoglobin and it leaves your blood with a deficiency of oxygen and with deficiency of oxygen you get these type of symptoms in the body so again we have the similar type of technology 
we can use and you can overcome this problem of nitrate removal. And this activation of nitrate can be done with common salt and which is easily available at all the places. And again, you've got various models. Uh, we have another technology which is iron, uh, contamination like iron. And iron is the most easiest uh, contamination to be taken care of. Uh, it does not require any operating cost. It is practically a free of cost treatment for op OPEX. You need this, definitely you need a system for fixing the iron, but you do not need uh, a, a operating cost because these are typical iron removal system which can be fitted on a hand pump. And just by reversing the flow, you can uh, recharge media. So the, by backwashing. So there are simple technologies uh, for to be used for communities for iron and different models. And this is something which can be used for, for homes and villas. And this can be used for larger installations and you can use uh, even for much bigger plants iron removal systems. And, and similar examples of manganese. Uh, I will not get into more repetitive exercise because this is getting repeated. Magnes also has similar type of problems and these are conventional methods. Uh, we can uh, ding down magnes removal, arsenic removal, and this is a contamination of arsenic. Uh, uh, similar technologies are used for arsenic and then uh, you need, uh, again for arsenic removal, you don't need any chemical. You just need to activate by backwash. So problem we talk about arsenic and if you use the simple technology for arsenic removal, Whatever investment you have to make for the capex of the plant is only made, and there is no other investment for arsenic removal. And you can use community based plants like this. And uh, uh, so, with this, probably I come to uh, closing to my presentation. We so far we talked about uh, water sources. We talked about from glaciers to groundwater. We talked about all various type of water sources. We talked about new emerging water sources, seawater, silage, sewage, rainwater, water conservation. We touched upon urban water needs, the concept of green building, the concept of uh, energy efficiency, the concept of, uh, I should say, the vertical farming, spawn cities. So we talked about con community involvement for addressing the contamination issues. And while we make this statement, most important for all of us is to understand that we have to come in terms of the reality. We must embrace the reality and we need a sincere commitment for our future generation, uh, which is independent of personal, political and physical boundaries. The moment we work towards it holistically, sincerely, I think we can solve this problem. It's not such a big problem. And we, the moment we manage it well, we can do it. What we need is a single step to move forward. And uh, with this, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much for patiently listening to me. And uh, let me get back to the stop share screen and see whether we have any questions which you can ask. Thank you very much. Yes, participants, if you have any queries, please ask in the chat box. Or you can directly unmute your mic and uh, directly ask to the sir. Yes, any participants? Uh, good evening, sir. So, thank you so much, sir. Okay. Yes, yes, ma'am. मैम मेरा कोई क्वेश्चन तो नहीं है बट आई आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक कि जो सर ने ये बताया कि देयर इज मोर मतलब स्कैर्सिटी की जगह हमारा जो फोकस है इट शुड बी ऑन द वाटर मैनेजमेंट दैट इज द नीड ऑफ आर मतलब वाटर मैनेजमेंट फ्रॉम पर्सन टू पर्सन फ्रॉम द होम फ्रंट ऑन द इंडिविजुअल कंज्यूमर फ्रंट एंड एज ए सोसाइटी फ्रंट आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक फॉर दिस वेरी वेरी नॉलेजेबल लेक्चर सर uh thank you so much thank you thanks lovely ma'am uh, so anybody else want to say something
so thanks to all uh, thank you sir thank you so much for sparing your valuable time and also for sharing your expert knowledge with all of us on this very important topic thank you so much sir thank you very much thank you thank you namaskar namaskar sir so thanks to all participants for their patience hearing मुझे लगता है कि अगर आप लोग थोड़ा क्वेश्चंस भी पूछे तो एक्सपर्ट्स को भी अच्छा लगेगा ना? और आप लोगों को भी थोड़ा और ज्यादा अच्छा लगेगा तो... मैम ये तो इतना सेल्फ एक्सप्लेनेटरी था कि इसमें कुछ पूछने के लिए है ही नहीं था मतलब इतना सेल्फ एक्सप्लेनेटरी था सर का मतलब क्या कहे उनको कि क्या पूछे सूर्य को दिया दिखाने के टाइम था अगर कुछ पूछते भी तो नहीं नहीं वो नहीं कई बार ना मतलब हमें भी जैसे व्हाट्सएप भी करते हैं कई जो एक्सपर्ट्स होते हैं कि अगर हमसे कुछ भी पूछे तो नहीं, नहीं, बहुत अच्छा नहीं है कि उनकी आप 